Mark Nelson is our first um, speaker tonight. We're in for a treat with all four of these guys. But uh, Mark not only is the chairman and CEO of the Institute of Ecotechnics, he was one of these brave, intelligent souls, eight souls that went into the Biosphere 2 project. The, um, let's see, in, uh, it was the, sorry, 3.15 acre material, materially closed facility near Tucson, the first, the world's first laboratory for global ecology. Dr. Nelson was a member of the eight person um, team that went in in 91 to 93. He started out, actually graduated um, cum laude from Dartmouth and somehow in the 1969 ended up in New Mexico interested in composting grass and, and all kinds of things important. Um, and that's when he met the rest of uh, these great folks here at Synergy. And um, without further ado, he's also the author of Life Under Glass and Space Biofears. Space biospheres. See, I'm already getting nervous because we're running late. So um, <laughs> he told me keep it short so we can get into the presentations. Each presentation will be 20 minutes. We're going to do three at 20 minutes and then take a nice little break with some snacks and uh, come back for Tony. So here's Mark, Dr. Mark Nelson. Well, indeed, it's a pleasure to welcome you to Synergy Ranch and to be part of this celebration of the... Yeah, let me know if you can't hear. Um, of the U.S. publication of Tony Juniper's book, which I really hope will prove a milestone in changing how we think about and value our global biosphere. Now, I, you know, I don't like hyperbole, but it's certainly not a hyperbole to say we are really entering a critical period of human evolution. The next few decades are gonna be kind of a make or break about whether we can get our act together and live sustainably, harmoniously, sustainably with our gravely threatened global biosphere. And in many traditions of the world, they say the first, the first step is to change your way of thinking, metanoia first step in the Buddhist Eightfold Path. So very briefly, within the constraints of the 20 minutes, that's the introduction that I, I've been given, I want to just lay out a couple of the ideas that guided the work of myself and many of the, my colleagues from the Institute of Ecotechnics who are present here. And a good way to start is Lewis Mumford, perhaps the greatest scholar and insightful person about the history of technology, traced in his great book, Technics and Civilization, the history of human techniques from before the Industrial Revolution to the two phases, as he saw it, of the Industrial Revolution to the present. And his present was in the 50s and 60s. And seeing the crisis that this technology launched on the, the uh, humanity and on the planet, he called for and he foresaw a new era, and he called it biotechnics, where life would be sensitive to human life. So we at the Institute, especially John, thought that we would extend that concept because technology doesn't have to be only sensitive and supportive of humans. I mean, it has to be harmonious with our global biosphere, thus the concept ecotechnics. So, we were young, we wanted to put ideas into action. So Ecotechnics was formed with the idea of hands-on projects in challenging regions to demonstrate the two aims. Can we increase the top line? That means increasing biodiversity and biomass, the ecological richness of our regions while also supporting and making better, strengthening the bottom line, conventional economics. So we had, let me call it, the perfect trifecta for an ecotechnics project. It had to be in a place of ecological degradation, sometimes devastation, which usually led to cultural conflict and marginal economics. On the bright side, since we had little capital and a lot of sweat equity, this led to some very good real estate investments. 
So next slide. I'm going to briefly run you through some of these endeavors. So you, you've just seen, uh, I hope, on the way in, and many of you are friends who know the ranch. This is a kind of view of the desolate, windswept, eroded, every mismanagement you can think of that only happened in about uh, 50 years. This is what Sinegaya Ranch looked like in the 1970s when we began making it our first ecotechnic challenge. Next slide. Same view, uh, this actually is the late 80s. The trees are probably five feet taller. And next slide. And abundance. You know, the orchard, apple trees, fruit trees, farmers markets, by their fruits you shall know them. So from there, we also branched out. I mean, ecotechnics is certainly not an American phenomenon. Next slide. Yeah, so in the tropical savanna of the Kimberley of West Australia, we met the tropical flip side or version of the Southwest, a brief century of European Australian mismanagement of this tropical savanna. 5,000 acres they gave us for $1.60 an acre because that was considered maybe these snakes would pay that ridiculous sum. Mm -hmm. Next slide. Mm -hmm. Then Tropical Rainforest is the project we began in the, uh, about 1983 in Puerto Rico, where the government was more than happy to give us about uh, 1,000 acres of secondary rainforest. Next slide. And the core of our endeavor has been to demonstrate sustainable forestry. We planted about 40,000 lime-planted trees. So instead of clearing the secondary rainforest, we're enriching it with uh, valuable native and, and tropical hardwoods. We're also learning to manage that secondary forest, which is now recovering, to, uh, to maximize its economic and sustainable values. Next slide. Then the Heraclitus, which actually was the second ecotechnic project. This was designed and built by members of the Institute in Oakland, California. Has traveled on many epic voyages more than the distance from here to the moon, currently in the Mediterranean uh, doing research. But our model there is that they're sea people. This is not your yacht. We are not visitors. The world ocean is a major component of planet Earth. Next slide. And we're also not 19th century ecologists. How can you ignore cities for the two great anthropogenic biomes, farming and cities? So this is our project in the world city, and because we also don't subscribe to reductionists that we are just ecologists, we work on enterprise ecology and art theater. The uh, focus of the gallery has been to showcase and to feature the trans-vanguard, the avant-garde from cultures around the planet. And last, oh, this is one of the exhibits of, uh, they've become really well known for their African art. Next slide. This is the, uh, our Mediterranean biome project uh, in Aix-en-Provence, an area that's actually under a great deal of assault because uh, land values are making these uh, traditional uh, places uh, unaffordable. And I wanted to throw in, this has been the locale for many of the Institute's annual conferences. Next slide. And because we have, we're honored to have some people from the Bucky Fuller Institute these conferences were a great uh, way for us to bring artists, scientists, explorers, thinkers from many cultures, from, from many backgrounds and viewpoints. And we got to meet a lot of our great heroes. And this is Bucky Fuller at our 1982 Galactic Conference with Bill Debster. Yes. So all of this planetary work was a perfect preparation for Biosphere 2. And just briefly, real briefly, I've got a lot of slides to go through. Three acre, the most tightly sealed structure ever built. Uh, you know, many little lessons that the designers, uh, especially John and Margaret, put in. The habitat, that uh, clad structure. And of course, this is Peter Pierce. This is basically uh, tensegrity, synergetic uh, structures. But the habitat is 10 feet lower than the rainforest. So we're you know, sending some messages about humanity and its place in the world. Next slide. And then uh, external uh, energy center. It's also one of the lungs to, to deal with pressure variations. Next slide. 
couple of views of the rainforest, that's the cloud forest. In each one of our biomes, and there are five wilderness biomes. Next slide. This is a view from the lowland rainforest. So, you know, we really wanted to maximize diversity, and, you know, one of our slogans was microbes are the unsung heroes of biosphere. So enormous uh, work was uh, done to maximize aquatic and soil habitat because you can't see them, but let me tell you, they keep the show going on planet Earth as well. Next slide. We, uh, we built the largest uh, coral reef uh, and tropical ocean ever built, about a, a, a million gallons. Next slide. With about uh, four dozen species of corals and myriad tropical fish. Next slide. Uh, oh yeah, we inserted a human crew. This is uh, <laughs> this is a picture on the beach after about a year, so we're a little bit thinner and healthier. Next slide. This is a view. I mean, this main wilderness structure extended 180 meters, 550 feet. We're looking into the mangrove, which had seven sections, brought from Florida Everglades, from from red mangroves to freshwater ecology. This is a Savannah Cliff. One of my, my teammates jumped off it. I would never do it. That's 35 feet from the ocean. So it was an amazing world. Next slide. And we have to feed ourselves. So this is the roughly half acre biosphere and intensive agricultural biome. All right, so I got involved in this. Institute of Ecotechnics was the main scientific consultant. Johnny, you know, who you'll hear in a bit, came up with the idea but we had a personal revelation. Next slide. I entered this, by this test module, which at the time was the biggest closed system in the world, about 50% bigger than what the Russians had built. I spent 24 hours in that thing. We needed to have people in there because we had a constructed wetland and they needed our sewage. But we also wanted everybody on staff to get the experience. And let me tell you, that was a consciousness changing, life defining experience. Because once you stepped in and that airlock stopped behind you, you actually couldn't avoid the reality that you were in a small life system. Mm -hmm. And those plants, and you could look at them, you know, it's kind of like, you know, not very much bigger than the number of people here. Those plants, those soils, they were keeping you alive. It was incredible. I'm kind of a choleric type, I was even more so. I got very jovial. I mean, my God, I'm in a really beautiful life support system. And I have a job in here too. I can keep the technology going, keep these plants and microbes really. So I stuck my hand up. And through a series of accidents and fortunes, I became invited to uh, be part of the eight, eight person crew. Next slide. So, how much time do I have left? Ten. Ten? Oh, okay, good. We're good. Okay, because I really want to, the core of what I really want to share with you, and I was reflecting when I was preparing some notes for this talk. I've met a lot of astronauts and cosmonauts, and I have to say, that's really cool. They get that overview effect. Every one of them has had you can tell it even before they begin talking to you. They have seen the Earth in a way that we can only imagine. I know we all watch you know, nature and documentary films and know them. They've been there. And I was thinking, my God, there's only about three dozen people, including the Russians who, built, who did the most advanced life support systems, who've ever lived in a mini life support system. And, you know, so I have an obligation that actually makes it it always, so, you know, bear with me, it's always it's very emotional. Because I had the great fortune of entering the structure. Next slide. So we have about five slides I'm not going to speak to, but we had a very rich and varied life in there. We wanted to, one, demonstrate living in a biospheric system is certainly not a penalty. We had the biosphere in handshake, I learned later that that's kind of common in prisons as well. But, but you know, we were volunteers. That, you know, we, we could go out anytime we wanted, who wanted to. As soon as we entered that structure, it was like the biosphere test module in space. 
something happened at a very deep cellular level. And you know, our catchphrase was <laughs> the health of this biosphere and our health, they're the same thing. Next slide. Very profound. And I have to say, okay, I've been working in ecotechnics, you know, theoretically I was right there, but there's something about embodying and having your organism understand these truths. Now, when we stepped into Biosphere 2, okay, it was a two year uh, closure experiment, but I tell you, we were actually space travelers and time travelers because we were stepping into a different metabolic biosphere. And you could tell it. You could tell there was some quickness in the pace of life inside. You know, we had you know, ton, we had a thousand sensors in the earth. We had, you know, teams of scientists. We calculated that CO2 would go up into the biosphere atmosphere and only stay there four days before it got absorbed by microbes, by trees, by the ocean, and continued its journey. Out here, it takes three years. So every year we had 90 cycles of that CO2, whereas two years out, out here is only two thirds of one cycle. So I mean the truth that, and of course we are incredibly careful about not putting toxic chemicals into that thing. If we were so stupid, mindless, suicidal, as to pollute our water, literally, within weeks it would be in our food and in our cups of tea. So it led to an incredible heightened, embodied understanding of our relationship with that system. I mean, another quick anecdote. You know, we had an analytic laboratory in there. We were deathly afraid of, of trace gases building up in the atmosphere. When someone wanted to, to do a plumbing repair, you know, use some, some glue and solvent for PVC, we looked at the, at the analyses of our atmosphere to see whether that was permissible. Mm -hmm. That kind of mindfulness. So bias for two, next slide of life inside. Bias for two was really revolutionary. It would have been revolutionary had we not even built the system. Because for four years during the design and creation phase, we had some of the world's top engineers and top ecologists. And at first, they couldn't even insult each other. They were just on different planes. Engineers don't normally sit down around the table with an ecologist. And ecologists usually go, oh my god, the engineers are coming, there's roads and bulldozers and bridges. Our precious nature is going to be destroyed. We had to get those people to speak together. Okay, you want a rainforest? You want a stream or a waterfall? What's the flow? What kind of pumps do you need? And the engineers. The engineers, man, we have many revolts. Engineers like to make things where nobody ever gets hurt. And they had to understand everything, all these impossible technological feats that they had to produce to make the system was only a supporting role. If the microbes and plants went on strike, it didn't matter how many pumps and fans and you know, water circulation technology worked. And every technology that went into Biosphere 2 was critiqued what does it out gets? What impact does it have? We had to do things like, which we don't have to do, thank goodness in the global biosphere, produce waves for our coral reef. How do we do that without impacting the fish? Well, there were vacuum pumps. Every bit of technology in there had to pass the test. Is this suitable? Can we recycle this? Can we live? And we, not just the humans, every life form in Biosphere 2 can't live with this technology. So in there, and I think there are enormous you know, lessons, we are not ever going to go back to some Rousseauian, next slide, pre-nature you know, state. That's not who we are. But when will we require the technology that we use in our global biosphere, the requirements that we have inside? So inside, it was like being on a ship in a way. We could hear technology buzzing and whizzing, and if some sound, technical sound stopped, that was a danger too, because we needed to keep it going. We humans, we had a role in there. We're not parasites, and we're not just, you know, 
bystanders, passengers. We had to keep the technology going, the sensors do the research so we maximize our understanding, and we had the role, because we didn't have elephants and tigers and whatnot, to be the keystone predators. So our job was to intervene in any of those biomes if biodiversity was threatened. Many a battle with, okay, we'll, we'll get on. Many a battle with passion fruit and morning glory and soon. <laughs> the meditation on, on sunfall, next slide. And we emerged a little bit thinner, but super healthy, records for, for closed systems, for water recycling, air recycling, really revolutionary. So revolutionary, of course, that Bias for Two remains controversial. Next slide. Nick and next one. These two slides, this is work of John Allen, but to, to show the comprehensive design, this is the ecological design of Biosphere 2. Next slide. And very revolutionary that the biosphere and the ethnosphere, including the technosphere, would have to harmoniously work together. And very quickly, lessons from Biosphere 2, three great ecological engineering came out of it. One is using plants and soils to clean up air. This, on your left is an air tron. Looks like a house plant because we're pumping the air actively through it 50 times the soil or the air purification. And it adapts to whatever contaminants you have. Next slide. This is me. I was a sewage manager in our constructed wetland. Totally fell in love with it. Next slide. And since then, we've been making wastewater gardens around the world. They look like beautiful gardens, but they're actually cleaning up your sewage and recycling the water. Next slide. And lastly, next slide. This agricultural system, you know, we had advisors who calculated we were the most productive agricultural system in the world. Next slide. And what a joy to, to work in that system. We produced all of our grains, all of our vegetables and fruits. Nothing got recycled, or nothing got thrown away. There is no away in a small system. Next slide. So the question is, what kind of lessons will we learn from Biosphere 2? Can Biospherics, this emerging science, teach us lessons about it? Well, I also want to invoke Bucky Fuller. He said a long time ago that there is a critical factor needed. We have to appreciate, we live on an incredibly wealthy planet. We have to come to our senses and understand that every bit of our life support comes from that global biosphere. That will change, absolutely, how we see our role. We're not outsiders, we're not passengers, we are active and important components of this global biosphere. And, you know, it amuses me when Biosphere 2 is taken over that the men in suits and then Columbia University was looking high and low for an operating manual. They didn't realize it was in the minds of the creators and the biospherians who had both had the adventure of making this world and operating it for four, for four years. So, and I know the Bucky Fuller people know where I'm going, we have a really important issue in front of us. Can we get it together? And we must get it together to develop a harmonious co-evolutionary operating manual for Spaceship Earth. And a little coda, there is a great perennial question. There's, is there intelligent life in space? Oh yeah. The real question is, is there intelligent life? And are we intelligent life on planet Earth? Thank you.